Welcome back to game day. In today's video, we're going to take a look at how DDR5 compares to DDR4 in Star Citizen and how far we can push DDR5 when we fully tune it. Now that DDR5 is widely available above 7000 megahertz and we're going to be testing the team group Delta RGB at 7200 megahertz. This memory stick is using the most powerful RAM dies from Hynix called a die. We picked this memory stick because these memory modules from Hynix are able to clock above 800 megahertz and to fully test out the performance of DDR5 I want to make sure we can test the widest variety of frequency speeds. To leave no stone unturned we are also using the most powerful DDR5 motherboard the Apex from Asus. This motherboard is specifically designed for overclocking, tuning and reaching memory speeds above 8000 megahertz. There are other cheaper motherboards out there that also has two dim slots which is a requirement to achieve these frequencies. For all the components used you can see the specs in the description below. But first, what are the differences between DDR5 and DDR4? To set the stage, we need to first understand what RAM really means. It stands for Random Access Memory, which allows the CPU to access data within the memory banks, irrespectively of the physical location of where the data is stored in, in almost the same amount of time. And this is a huge contrast with other direct access data storage storage medias such as hard disks, CDs and other physical media where the data speed access is dependent on where the data is actually physically stored. Therefore, one of the key performance indicators for memory is the latency. And finally, DDR stands for double data rate. This means for every clock cycle, the random access memory can read two data signals. These data signals are carried on the up curve and down curve curve of the clock cycle. So what this really means in DDR terms is that when you see any frequency label on your stick, let's say 3200 megahertz, the true frequency is actually 1600 megahertz because one cycle in hertz carries two data points and that the reference wording for the 3200 megahertz is actually 3200 mega transfers. But for the sake of our sanity, we're not going to use the word mega transfer because both the RAM manufacturers, Intel, the motherboards, everybody has commonly accepted the marketing term megahertz. And finally, the number after the DDR, so DDR4 and DDR5, the 4 and 5 is just the wording given by an organization called JDEC, which stands for Joint Electronic Device Engineering Council, which is an association combining over 300 organizations who writes the standards for specific electronics. And and they specifically write the standards for DDR to ensure that all manufacturers manufacture within the same specs so we can move these RAM sticks from motherboard to different CPU manufacturers and they will all be compatible. Imagine that you have to buy a specific RAM stick for AMD and a specific RAM stick for Intel and that would just never work in a mass scale of things. So JDEX sets the standards and now they have DDR4 and DDR5 available to consumers. The main different standards that set with DDR5 5 compared to DDR4 is, is that DDR5 has a new architecture which allows the CPU to access the memory banks using two channels directly on the memory. Memory channels has been available for a long time on motherboards and you might be familiar with it called dual channel and quad channel. This dual channel now exists natively on the memory. As such, when you put in your dual channel DDR5 on a dual channel motherboard, it shows up as quad channel in every RAM reading software such as IDA64 and the other reading software used throughout this video. This allows the CPU to access the data banks in parallel, increasing the bandwidth further. I hope you enjoyed this explanatory part and without any further delays, let's take a look at how Star Citizen performs with DDR5 and then let's take a look how it compares to DDR4. And as always, we are doing the lower run. If you want to copy it, then please pay attention as it's been running in the background. This is obviously Star Citizen 3.18, the latest patch. And as always, we begin with the plug 
plug and play settings. These are the settings the motherboard will automatically set when you are building your system for the first time and have not touched the BIOS. This is pure plug and play. As a result, the Apex motherboard sets the DDR5 at 5600 megahertz with loose timings of 46, 46, 46, 89. With plug and play and Lorval, we're getting 36.6 on the 1% low and 65.8 on the average. Hmm. This looks awfully familiar. Overlaying the plug and play settings of DDR4, we can see that the performance is virtually the same at 2666 MHz CL19. And by enabling XMP on the same frequency by reducing the CL to 36, we're seeing a massive jump from 65 on average to 84 on average. This is because the latency has been significantly decreased. Going from 6000 MHz, we're seeing a decent improvement, but but then moving from 6,000 all the way to 7,800, we are seeing a marginal increase in performance. This is because as we go up higher frequencies, we're also increasing the CL. So the timings are getting looser, and as a result, we're just gradually improving performance from each kit. To dive deeper into this, let's take a look at IDA64's results, going from each frequency all the way up to 8,200 megahertz. As you can see, for each frequency step improvement, we're also increasing the read, write, and copy bandwidth but also gradually decreasing the latency. Summarizing the performance indicators from all the IDA64 results, I put it in a graph where you can see the blue indicating the latency, which is lower is better. Meanwhile, the grayscale is read, write, and copy. Higher is better. You can see how the performance increases. Now let's take a look at the final performance I was able to achieve with these DDR sticks. I was pleasantly surprised to see the performance I was able to achieve with 8,200 megahertz. For the first time, I was reaching scores with over 60 FPS on the 1% lows and also over 110 FPS on the average, resulting in the five runs an average of 103 FPS and 1% low being 59.4 FPS. This was nothing but impressive. The tuned results is a 10% average improvement over 7,800 seal 36. The performance felt absolutely amazing. So let's take a look at how it performs in Orison area 18 and how it performs up against the other CPUs. All right, deep diving into and we can see that the DDR5 tuned versus the tuned DDR4 are rather neck on neck, but the DDR5 is edging out the DDR4 with roughly 7 to 8 percent. In area 18, the tuned DDR5 was much more stable. The performance is roughly 15 percent higher in 1 percent low, and that was very noticeable. In area 18, with fewer entities, it just felt so much smoother on the DDR5 system. Finally, Lorville, the performance was much better in DDR5 versus DDR4, and you can actually just feel it when you do these runs over and over again, especially doing five runs per setting. Definitely noticeable. 10% bump is noticeable. And the DDR5 versus DDR4, it just feels more stable overall. In addition, looking at the power consumption, I noticed that DDR5, because of the higher bandwidth, consumed roughly 30% more power power than the DDR4 platform. This is because the integrated memory controller on the CPU now have to process roughly twice the bandwidth. As a result, it puts more stress on the memory controller and the individual cores, yep, resulting in 30% higher wattage. In conclusion, the fastest DDR5 is currently roughly 10% faster in Star Citizen than the fastest DDR4 fully tuned. But overall, nothing has changed. The only thing unoptimized is still your PC. Whether you're on DDR4 or DDR5, tuning your system will yield higher performance. Do not go on Star Citizen's forums and complain about how the game is unoptimized, whether you are on a DDR4 or DDR5 platform. Looking at the cost of building a DDR5 system with 4090, comparing it to a DDR4 system, we can see that the cost is roughly 13% higher with this Apex board, which costs more than twice as much as a standard DDR4 board. It costs 13% more, but we're seeing an average 10% higher performance. So you're only paying a roughly 3% premium to get this 10% higher performance. I would argue that it is worth it, but note that my build consists of premium fans, but also 
three NVMe SSDs as I'm a content creator and I require extra storage. You can definitely build a more cheaper 3900K with a 4090 build by removing cheap those expensive fans, but also just having one SSDs for your OS and games. So the entry price of a 3900K and the 4090 platform with DDR4 can go as low as 3,400 pounds slash dollars. But for that price range, you are trading cooling capacity, but also storage capacity. For that price range, you're probably better off going for the 7800X3D, which we just ordered, hoping to get it soon for testing. Now, if you find this video useful and interesting, please like and subscribe. And if you're interested in learning more about RAM tuning, please check a look at my first RAM tuning video right here.